welcome friends to this uh, monthly meeting that we have in order to remind ourselves of the importance of why we are human beings and what is the purpose of being human beings and that is to be able to take advantage of some of the facilities given to us only as human beings which is to be able to find out who we really are where is our true home where do we belong and this is to remind us of our spiritual journey the most important thing that we can find as a purpose of life we get embroiled we get so involved in the world around us in the experiences we have generated for ourselves in our lives that we forget who is the experiencer the experience become more important than the experiencer the human being is made a human being to be able to ask that question who am i no other form of life asks this question there are lots of forms of life according to indian scriptures they list 8.4 million forms of life and when they say forms of life they are referring to the principle of life that means something that makes us grow something that makes us live and that principle has been called by different names sometimes soul atma whatever name you want to give it a living principle something is making us alive and we are taking different forms 8.4 million forms and out of those only one form the human form has the capacity to ask a question who am i really they're taking a form and that is why this monthly meeting is to remind us have we carried out our task have we carried out the purpose of life to find out who we are people asking me in emails and questions tell us what is the purpose of life i said find out who you are isn't that an important thing why is it important because we know the form is very short lived nobody lives in, nowadays even 100 years and we are talking of life form that has existed for millions of years some say billions of years some say this universe is dissolving and reappearing again and again for way back billions of years in that time frame to appear in a form for a hundred years or less and not know who you are who is appearing again and again who has appeared so that's an important question and just to be able to find an answer to that question we come and meet every month here to remind us when we look at a human body we say what is inside this body it appears that lot of things inside lot of not only lot of things inside lot of organs inside lot of tissues inside lot of states of awareness inside lot of energies inside look at the small body containing so much wealth of awareness and energy and by the way they are two different things sometimes we mix up we start calling awareness as a form of energy certainly not energy is what makes you energize and function in a particular way energy does not give you awareness of who you are no energy can give you that awareness awareness is to know to have a knowledge of who you really are and that is why in this body we have centers of energy and centers of awareness such a miraculous thing i cannot imagine any miracle that has ever happened compared to the miracle of of having a body a human body containing so much awareness and so much energy we also sometimes look at our body it's one body some scientists are saying what about the trillions of bacteria living inside you what are they thinking about it they are thinking oh we are just living in a universe of our own and we think we are just one body of ourselves only one cell today they are studying these bacteria even more than they studied ever before what they are doing good bacteria bad bacteria wearing labels good and bad some having very different taste in their food bad bacteria like junk food 
and good bacteria like fiber and all good food all that was considered healthy for the human body is now considered good or bad food for a bacteria living inside us as we study this body further we are more amazed where are these centers of energy operating from what are they doing where are the centers of awareness what are they doing are they making different personalities of us i had a meeting with a very great man dr bhagwan singh gyani he was an indian philosopher who came and settled down in a place tuhana near on the border of mexico and usa in california and he wrote many books he wrote books on karma and dharma books on consciousness books on many subjects and those books are available after 50 years of residing in united states on the border with mexico he returned to india i was at that time working with the government in india and the my boss the chief minister of the state was a friend of that bhagwan singh gyani so they met there dr gyani gave a talk then i met him further and because of the friendship we had he transferred the possession of all those hundreds of books to me and the united states government when they found he died passed away after that they brought boxes and boxes of books into india he also wrote books on astrology numerology and all this i got time to study some of them they found what what vast knowledge he had he says the human body does not contain one personality but several personalities he says we are a composition of at least nine personalities that we have different personalities based upon the energy on which our attention goes he described the energy centers as separate forms of the personalities of a human being he said if you take the six centers of energy i don't talk much about them because i feel that for higher awareness you can start from the centers of awareness but great master baba saavan saying used to sometimes when the yogis and swamis who had been practicing the yoga of the six centers would come to him he would explain to them the functioning of these energy centers so today i might share with you some of the ideas that dr bhagwan singh shared with me and what great master used to explain that these energy centers in us make us different personalities we have in us a human being who is always wishing for something the wishing human being is a personality all of us are sometimes i wish it when i wish wish like that is that a different being from the one who is trying to meditate is a different being who is trying to feel hungry is a different being who is trying to think intellectually of a new idea of course it's different that means we have a human being in this body who is wishing for things and it corresponds to the lower center on the ground we are grounded when we sit on the floor not on the chair we feel really down on the ground sitting down that's how we used to sit in the old times and this was considered that you are grounded and our wishes are all for grounded things they're always wishing for them the next higher chakra which they call the swadasthan the pleasure chakra which is sexual ch chakra we all have interest in sex we are a sexual person it makes a sexual person and that personality can be so strong it can overwhelm other personalities in a state of sexual desire and sexual urges one can forget the other personalities altogether a very strong personality living in us all the time then we move up further to the next higher chakra in us the center of energy we become the hungry person we are all hungry our hunger is essential for us because we are the hungry person the personality of the hungry person comes up we all want food no matter what it is built into us the hungry persona is also part of this human being we can come up further to the next center and we are all emotional beings we react emotionally to everything we can't control it we try to control tears come into our eyes 
we try to control we feel sad we feel joyful simple things make us feel joyful so many people come to me and they start crying and i say what have i done <laughs> why are they crying i didn't do anything and the crying personality comes up all from the heart chakra these chakras are performing a function automatically they are making us that person when the attention is placed on those chakra whether automatically autonomously or deliberately it doesn't matter then we come up to the next chakra and we are the dreamy people we dream of ideas imagine things the dream sequences are arising from the kant chakra from the throat chakra and then we come alive and say no no this is all part of our body but we are really in thinking people we think from the eye center all these persona are sitting inside us and we use this persona we we use this different personalities every day and we react differently and we don't realize it's all part of this package we call a human body and it's daily use sometimes we cannot control which which uh, part of us need more attention which need less but if we keep an awareness awareness means that you remember it you know it and you don't forget it if you can remember these functions and know that in the wakeful state we are primarily at the eye center we are looking at the world through the eyes we don't have to look at the world through the eyes when we are in other centers but when we are awake and looking at the world we are looking through the eyes windows of the soul our soul our consciousness our life is performing a very important function to look out what is there therefore the most important sense perception is the perception of vision see the sense perception has two parts the physical eyes that look inside and the eyes behind the physical eyes that can look inside we all have these two pairs of eyes with the physical eyes we see what is in front of us with eyes closed we can see what we can imagine both are eyes both can see we are constantly using the physical eyes to see outside and we think that's the only way to see totally incorrect with the physical eyes we can only see what is in front of us in our eyes we can see anything way beyond what is in front of us or not in front of us the power of imaginative seeing is so great that there is no limit to it and yet all our life we are try to think oh seeing is just the physical eyes why don't you see more with the inner eyes and where are the inner eyes functioning right behind these eyes if you want to say you want to imagine something you want to imagine a big house a mansion in front of you right now you close your eyes mansion in front of you where are the eyes seeing from that mansion with these eyes closed where are the mansion being seen the same place you are still in the same place you are not seeing from the hands or the body or the heart or anywhere else at all you are still the inner eyes are exactly just behind the physical eyes that's how we imagine and see things not only that if you see something outside and close your eyes for a moment you can still see what you saw outside inner eyes can retain the image that the physical eyes cannot retain therefore we are ignoring a very important part of us the persona that can use not only the vision the capability of vision and seeing it can also imagine smelling touching tasting at the same place if you imagine that you can see from inside with these eyes closed can you touch things imagine anything in your hand you can feel it and touch it supposing you have these bunch of flowers the beautiful flowers you see so beautiful flowers inside after seeing them once i can see them again now by closing my eyes if you close your eyes and see these flowers 
try it out you can smell them also if i give you a piece of a, a glass of water to drink outside and you imagine you have a glass of water inside you can drink it also taste it also how come that what we thought was only a function of the different sense perceptions on the physical body are also operating inside without any physical matter at all what is the power that is giving us this facility that we can have all the five senses intact operating right from behind this physical eyes in the same way as this body is functioning so we definitely have an inner body how would you describe the inner body you close your eyes and look at the body feel the body very few people do that but when we want to know who we really are that's the first step we should do first step we should take to find out what is happening inside us if you close your eyes which they say meditation starts by closing your eyes a good way to tell us cut off what you're seeing outside see what is inside with the inner eyes when you see with the inner eyes the one that sees with the inner eyes has all the five senses intact has the thinking power intact has the power to make comments on what you are seeing intact and is alive that means when we close our eyes we are coming across our self not the self of the six, uh, six centers i have explained to you a self that is not the six centers is not connected with outside activities but has the capacity of having the same soul life same power to think reason make comment same power to see touch taste and smell that means the only thing missing in that inner self and the outer self in this body is the body everything else is intact is it amazing that we have constantly thought that the physical body is our body and we have something sitting inside with everything possible that we can do with this body except it is without this physical body first step in knowing we are not merely the physical body the physical body and its organ are not the only way we are experiencing anything we are experiencing it inside all the time if you study this fact more carefully you will be absolutely surprised that when we see with these eyes we only see when we can see with the inner eyes these eyes do not operate on their own if you are not conscious if you are sleeping eyes can be open you don't see physical eyes don't see you see in the eyes are open and are behind the eyes you will find all five sense perceptions operating on this body are operating because they are operating in the inner self which one would you call the real one would you call this body real compared to what the other one is functioning and if you are able to spend more time on the inner body every day try to see what else it can do it can do things this body can, physical body can never do it can fly in the sky it can jump from sky and not get hurt it is free of pain it's free of so many disabilities the physical body has and yet it has everything intact except the physical matter of this body should we spend more time in that body than in this when we are sitting here how much time do we spend in that hardly any and we are forced to spend some time in the inner body when we go to sleep become unconscious of this body and once in a while have dreams which we can remember which is not voluntary at all we never say what we dream about in wakeful state we can dream of anything in sleep state we lose control as if some autonomous thing is operating in us creating dreams sometimes such horrible dream we don't like them so why are we losing control in order to have an experience of something more real inside us than this physical body itself why not train ourselves 
to use the inner body effectively while we are awake. You don't have to sleep and then become unaware of this body. You can be awake and become unaware of this body. Simple techniques taught by all these masters of meditation. What is the purpose of meditation? What is meditation? To meditate is to think about something. I meditate upon a book. I meditate upon my relationship with my friend. I meditate upon myself. Which self? The inner self. When we close our eyes and meditate upon our inner self, the mind speaks up. Because the mind has got so used to the pleasures and temptations, outside experience has generated for us, the mind says, that's imaginary, forget it, open your eyes and see the real thing. And the mind convinces us again and again, what these eyes can see is more real than what the inner eyes can see. And we get confused. Not only confused, we get misled. And begin to, ma to meet the desire of the mind to constantly keep out. Why does the mind do that? It is created for that purpose. If the mind was our soul, it would never do that. If we know any definition of soul, if we know what life is, if we know where the soul comes from, if we know our true home, where the soul originates, where it belongs, if we knew that, my mind would never behave like that, but the mind is separated from the soul. Life is separated from a functionally attached to life. And that function of the mind is to create and enjoy what it creates. But we've forgotten even that part. We think the creation is independent. This creation is totally independent of ourselves. It has been existing for billions of years. We only come for a little while to enjoy this creation or suffer the creation, suffer more than enjoy. And that is how we have accepted life. Totally untrue. The untruth of this can be found very easily by going and studying what the mind is, what the inner self is. It's as simple as that. We don't do that. I have come to remind you that is the real purpose of life. To be able to find out what are we made up of. What are these several personalities in us? I have only mentioned the six personalities based upon the energy we are using. The seventh personality is the one that can imagine anything and be anything. And we sometimes call it our own astral self. Our own suksham sharif. That this is physical astral sharif. Mortal body. And we have an immortal body inside that can last for longer. How can we believe that our imaginative self, which we think our own mind is imagining, how can it be la lasting longer than a body in which it is functioning? If our brain is creating that imaginative self, and the brain dies with the body, was born with the body, grew up with the body, this physical body, how can we possibly say that there is an inner body in this which lasts longer? Any proof of that? They are trying to find proof also physically. They are saying, oh, what is in the brain? Those cells that are there in the brain, it's, after all, it's made up of matter. The brain is made up of matter, of flesh and tissue, also is made of matter, and has something in it which they discovered every cell of the body has. The center of the cell, every cell of a living body has DNA. A good name. Oh, DNA contains everything. What does it contain? The history of the human race, the history of the plant race, that we can trace even the first living cell through the DNA of any one of our cells, especially brain cell. Therefore, brain can remember things. We were not there. Brain cell were there. Physical analysis, physical description, taking the physical reality to be the only reality we can come out with these kind of explanations. But what about the self, our self, trying to find out for our self what's actually happening? We can perform a very different kind of experiment than just study a DNA molecule. We can study ourselves. 
we can easily see we have another self in us just by closing the eyes and imagining. Easiest part. Okay, let's start with the easiest part. We close our eyes and we find our seventh self inside performing all functions of sense perceptions, able to think, able to do everything this body is able to do. Does it also have memory? In this body, we use something very useful called memory. We can remember things. When we use memory in the physical body, we are confining our memory to what we can associate with the physical body. When I was young, I was very small, I can remember. I remember as a child. I remember I had breakfast this morning. I remember everything connected with physical body. What about remembering something with the inner body? It can be done same way. Supposing you close your eyes and operate the inner body. And with the inner body which can see through imagination, inner body that can fly in space, has no weight, no matter, no physical matter in it. Supposing we say, let me remember something of the inner body. You will be absolutely surprised. Try it out. You will remember things that happened before you were born in the physical body. How is that possible? Where is that coming? It's not somebody else telling you. You don't go to somebody else. Please tell me my past life regression. How does another person know anything about your past life? Only you can know it. And it's not somewhere else outside sitting there. It's inside you. But if you have the time and the capacity to use inner body, which can be obtained very easily. I'm talking of the easiest part of discovering yourself. If you can do that, you will see, if you remember, where did you have that ability to fly? That you're flying now in the inner body, in your imaginative self. When did you have it? What are the circumstances when you had it? Do you remember when, how often you did it? And put the dates back. You'll start remembering things that happened way earlier, 400 years back, 1000 years back. You'll remember strange things which have no connection with the physical body outside. Yet they are your memory, not somebody else's. You are remembering something. That is giving the clearest proof that what we think is totally imaginary pre-existed even the birth of this body. Of course, that is not the only way to determine that. Because if you can disassociate the experience of the physical body completely from the inner body, then you can remember and do things which you can never do with the physical body. The disassociation of the inner self from the physical body is called true meditation. To meditate upon the self means to be able to disassociate your physical body from your inner self, which means to become unaware. Question sometimes comes up, we are talking of becoming unaware of this body. We do become unaware of the body every night when we go to sleep. Where do we go? Where does the inner body go then? If we are, do we die? We don't die, we wake up. Where are we when we are sleeping? We must be somewhere that we don't know where we are and we never ask questions where we are. But if we try to analyze where do we go when we go to sleep, we find we lose the center of wakefulness. That's all. Sleep is nothing more than losing the center of wakefulness. Right now, you feel that you are looking through these eyes. In sleep, you lose that capacity to feel that you are looking through these eyes. You can get into a dream state and then see with the dream eye, dream body eyes, not with this body. When we are seeing with your dream body eyes, is the dream body exactly at the same place as this body? You are lying down in bed. The dream body is running around all over. Where is the dream body running around? Is it running around behind your eyes or somewhere else? If you study carefully the, how sleep takes place, how dreams take place, study them, you will find that sleeping and dreaming is nothing more than losing the capacity to be behind the eyes. 
then you move away from these eyes, you become dream that creature. You can test many times. People have dreams and they can know it's a dream. I know I had dreams like that where I felt that I am dreaming and I have to find where I am sleeping. I am running all the way back to my bed to find out where I am sleeping. And when I woke up, I discovered I had gone nowhere. Then how did I locate some other place from where I was running back to wake up and I am waking up in the same place where I slept? This disassociation of the location of where you are seeing outside is creating the dream effect. When you lose that point, I give you another method of checking it out. Let us say not full sleep, say in a sleepy state, you are feeling very drowsy and about to sleep. Do a little experiment. Close your eyes and you are dreaming or you are about to dream, still aware of this body. Try to touch your eyes with your hand. When you are awake, any time you can touch your eyes. Even with eyes closed, you can touch your eyes. No problem. When you are a little drowsy, try to touch your eyes, touch your nose and think you are touching your eyes. You are moved. That's the only thing. The problem is we have moved away from the eye center. The position behind the eyes. From where the inner eyes are working. When that moves, you lose awareness of the self. That is why when we say disassociate yourself from the body, how are we going to disassociate other than moving away? Can we disassociate while still staying there? That would be a new experience. That would not be sleep, not be dream. That would be new experience if we can disassociate ourselves from the physical body while still staying at the eye center. There are some good gifts we have been given as human beings which we can use to do that. What are those gifts? First gift is the power of attention. We can put our attention where we like. Very big gift. If we had no power of attention, the whole thing was what it is in front of us all the time, we would not have the, any ability to find who we are. By giving us the power of attention, that we can put attention where we like. I want to look at the flowers again. I can put attention on the flower and ignore everything. I can put attention on the microphone, ignore everything. The power to put attention is amazing power. The most useful power in discovering ourselves. And the second part of it is the power to concentrate our attention wherever we like. Wonderful ways that we can put attention where we like, we can concentrate attention where we like. I want to concentrate my attention right on the target. I'll ignore everything. Arjun was being taught how to use bow and arrow. And when he was asked, he can see the tree or only the target. When he could see the leaves of the tree, he could not accurately fire the arrow. The arrow. When he said, I can see nothing but the target. It went right on target. Power of concentration of attention can actually squeeze away the awareness of what is around it. Now imagine the cap capabilities we have that we can put the same attention we are putting on flowers and this thing and outside on targets. We can put the same attention on ourselves, on the inner self. If you put the same attention on our inner self and think of nothing else but the inner self, what would happen? Gradually, we will not know what is happening around us. If you stay longer enough, in that exercise of concentrating your attention on your own self, you will gradually not know even the physical body. But no, not all at once. People who have done this exercise, they say, the first thing we forget is that we don't know where our legs and feet are, where our hands are. As if the extremities are of this physical body are the ones we lose awareness of when we concentrate our attention behind the eyes on the inner self. Then we begin to forget where the torso is from the bottom upward. As if there is a whole cycle of withdrawal of consciousness, withdrawal of awareness, withdrawal of life as we know it from the body takes place in stages. 
Now, interesting point is that when a person physically dies, and I've seen a lot of physical deaths in my time now, at my age, all my colleagues have died. Many of them, I saw them in terminal states of dying in the hospital. When they die, first thing they don't know is where the hands and feet have gone. Then they don't know where the legs and arms have gone. Same process they are going through. Every time the physical body dies and they are gone. And we don't know where they have gone. But if we do it to ourselves, we will know where we go. If we carry out this exercise upon our own self and we draw our attention behind the eyes and concentrate on only knowing what, what is happening there, only using the inner eyes, only inner ears, only inner tongue, inner, inner nose, and do everything. How can we do all those everything? Great power of imagination. We can imagine we are walking on a street. We can imagine we are flying in the sky. We can imagine we are eating food. We can imagine we are smelling flowers. There is no end to how much you can imagine. How does imagination help you? It makes your inner body active. And don't go by the misleading idea of the mind and the comment making. This is all imaginary. For a moment, allow that thought to go away and study what is happening actually. When you concentrate your attention to that, said by imagining all activities taking place with the inner self, you will notice this body will die like it dies in physical death. But really it won't die because you have not moved from the third eye center. Therefore, you are still quite intact in this body. Go nowhere. Awake. You are fully awake in this body and fully awake in the inner body. Can you imagine? Nothing has happened. You are fully awake. This body is functioning exactly as it functions when you are alert. Inner body is functioning exactly alert. Only thing that's happened is you have, by power of concentration, your attention, put the whole attention on the inner self and withdrawn your attention from this body and become unaware of it. This is disassociation of the physical self with that. It's a wonderful experience because then the inner self can remember all its past lives without going to any other person to tell us, who was I? When I ask these people, do you find out who they were? Oh, they were Cleopatra and Anthony and they're all heroes in the past. They're all made up stories. Find out who actually you were. It's inside you. Your memory is there. Your memory, if it was not in the inner cell, would not be in any DNA molecule at all. It's your own self. They are going outside anywhere. Understand the power of the seventh form of our personality far higher than the six personalities I counted outside based on energy. Look at the first personality, seventh personality of pure based upon your own experience of sense perceptions. And nothing else. You could see, you could touch, you could taste, you could smell. That's all you did. That's all you do from here. And this body is quiet. You have become unaware of it. It may have fallen down. It may have tripped over. You don't know. You've moved over. This is amazing experience and it gives us a guideline that if we have to find more about <coughs> ourselves, it has to be inside, not outside. Running around outside will not give us any knowledge when even the first step to know there is something else inside is obtained by going within ourselves through concentration of our own attention on ourselves. But that's not the end of the journey. We are only found out that we have a sense perception built into ourselves which certainly outlasts this physical body. If we can remember things, we can also get some idea how men were we born. In this physical body, when we remember our childhood, we say, yeah, I was born long ago, I remember some scenes and I can look at the calendar and say, oh, it was, in my case, I can say it was 93 years ago that I have been in this body. What will happen if I do the same thing with the inner body? I say, yes, I remember when the body came into me. Oh, I remember 3,000 years ago. You can remember it. Not somebody else suggesting to us anything. Discovery from our memory. Don't forget, we are using memory all the time for everything. 
if we did not have memory, we would not even have the life experience, I can tell you. I often quote this and people get a little surprised that we think we are living in time. We are not living in time, we are living in memory. The concept of time is being given by memory alone. Otherwise, I can easily tell you, are you living in the present, in the now or anywhere else? All will say now. And now has no time at all. The moment we say now, it's past. Before I said it was past, future. Past and future can be explained by memory. But you can't explain now with memory at all. Therefore, if now has no time, we are living in no time. They are what is giving us the sense of time. They are studying so hard in physics, the nature of time, and having big con confusion. The entanglement of particles has completely destroyed their idea whether space and time exist or not. They are in such a weird state of thinking, and yet we can easily find out from our own self from inside that it is merely memory that's creating this experience. They don't want to study memory. They want to study cells. They want to study particles, nanoparticles, more nanoparticles, finest particles. The study is continuously that we must take the outside world as reality. Little realizing that the outside world for the greatest scientist is coming only from his sense perceptions. Nowhere else. There is no way we have to experience the world anywhere except through our sense perceptions. And sense perceptions are a separate body sitting inside us. It's such a simple thing. But only those can say who have examined what, sense, what is inside us, not outside. So when you see that we are living in zero time, what we experience and say is in the present is immediate past. There can be no present. Now has no time. Can we say at least a future exists from where all the events are flowing in and they just flow past us in zero time and therefore we think they are the present? Let me remind you further. If your mind did not anticipate anything, did not hope for anything, did not fear anything, there would be no future. We are constantly creating a future by these functions of the mind. The mind is creating the functions of future and these things which I am calling anticipating, hoping or fearing takes place in time, therefore they are in the past when we do it. They don't happen in now. The future is past. You will notice past is, there is no way for a human being to experience the past except through memory. If you don't remember, there is no past. So understand the role of memory. It's a very big role. It's the role that's acting right now to create time for us. It's creating events for us. Creating events in the future, in the past, everything through memory. So memory is a very big function. If you go deeper into meditation, as some of you would like to go, you can go and discover where memory comes from. What is memory? How do you generate memory? Is the mind generating memory? Is the brain, physical brain holding cells that is containing memory? Or is memory something different? You can compare the two. You can see what the brain is holding. You can see what your inner self is holding from where you are thinking. It's very hard task even for medical scientists or any other scientist to discover how the thinking operation takes place in the brain, in the mind and can mind be separate? Can consciousness be separated? Can the activities of thinking be separated from the body? A new study done recently on near-death experiences and the Recent experiences have shown that even when the body is dead, physically, clinically dead, and can be restored by some method, the experiences that are generated are experiences of memory that have not been given up by death. How they found out? The doctor, uh, the doctor Fleming or somebody, I saw his talk and his book the other day. He writes that he studied near-death experiences. He's a neurosurgeon. As a neurosurgeon, when first time he was told there can be reincarnation, he poo-pooed the area. Nonsense! 
there is no such thing. There is no out of body experience that the people claim it's all within this brain. Brain can create that experience. Then he began to study these different uh, episodes of near-death experiences. People began to tell what happened when they died. People began to explain. They could see the surgeon operating on the body. They gave vivid explanations. And he discovered something very strange. First time, he discovered people in the West, in Europe and America, when they have an NDE, near-death experience, they see a white a tunnel and white light at the end. But people who have near-death experience in India and China don't see that white light. They see a, the image of the deity they worshipped, the Buddha, or some goddesses. They appear. And he now discovered near-death experience is linked with memory, a memory that exists when you are dead and the line on your heartbeat is dead. First time a discovery is being made that human memory can survive even death. Then where does it go? Where do you, how can you remember something if you are dead? So that is why to get the answer to that, you can't look outside. Look where the memory is being practiced by you, which is inside. Where is the memory practiced? Not in the sense perception, not in this body. It's practiced in the mind. Why not go one step further within yourself to study the mind. And that can be done. How? Meditation in the inner self in which the mind is operating. The process is so simple and elementary that if you want to go within, put your attention on within. In this body, when we close our eyes, we are putting our attention on what is behind the eyes inside. If you have practiced long enough to withdraw your attention, Consistently with the physical body, you are able to sit in the inner body whenever you like, every day. And then you meditate in the inner body. Put your attention on the, uh, behind the eyes of the inner self. What will happen? Same thing that happened to the physical body. You will become unaware of the sense perception. It's a remarkable experience. Try it out. You will be amazed. That sense perceptions were merely a second body, just like the physical body, upon yourself. And what you are left with is your mind. And, of course, the life-giving force called soul. You, can, you have the capacity sitting in human bodies today to experience your mind and be unaware of the physical body and your sense perception. What do you discover at that stage? you discover how memories are being manufactured inside by the very thing you call mind. The mind manufactures memories and those memories are becoming our life here. We say, where is my destiny coming from? I can tell you, you the exact place where it is being made. And how does destiny vary so much? How can we have different destinies in different people? Because the mind has a very long memory of millions of years and is constituting new combination, new permutations of events at that stage and making up new life patterns of memories and the memories are being transferred to the sense perception in the inside and from there to the physical body and lives are being made physical, astral and mental, which we sometimes call causal. From asthul sharir, physical body, we go to suksham sharir, astral body, we go to causal body. Karan Shiri, rightly called Karan and or causal, the experience that we are generating here is all made there. First time you will realize there is no outside existence at all. It's all being generated from the power of consciousness within you. Before that, you can't know that. Before that, the world looks too dear, created by the memory of a past, present and future. It's remarkable how this creation takes place and yet you have the power to discover how creation is created. And no way to run to get to find an answer within yourself. Well, I would be very happy if that were a great destination for a spiritual journey. And a lot of people are happy with that. A lot of people are thinking, if we can reach that state, we have attained complete moksha, liberation from everything. Naturally, when you find out this is all a made-up stuff, it's a liberation. 
but is still not knowing who you are. Is the thinking self that you have discovered the power of memory making? Is that your self? Or are you the life that is making it happen? There is a possibility to go even beyond that. And I can tell you very few people I have met in life, very few people who are able, who are able to describe the process by which we can go beyond our own mind into discovering what is the soul, what is life, what is, what is making everything work. Very few people have done that. I am very fortunate, I tell you, extremely fortunate that I met a man who was able to tell me about it and tell me the secret of it. The picture you see here, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, great master. I call him the greatest master because of what he could share with me. And he shared the wonderful knowledge that there is no practice available in the world, no meditation available in the world, no matter what people are saying, that can take you beyond the mind. Because all practices are being practiced by the mind. When you say, I'm going to do something, you are doing it to the mind. There is no other way. The ego, the face of the mind, which creates an I in us, which separates us from everybody else. If we didn't have the I, we would all be one. But the I separates us. Great separator. The ego is the greatest separator that I have ever found. I know this. Therefore, you are separate. Everybody is separate. I have an I in me. When you have an I, the I meditates. Therefore, meditation keeps you in the I. If I does not meditate, who is meditating then? You don't know anything at all. Therefore, all meditation of every kind, no matter what religion, no matter what yoga, I have tried so many yogas myself, they are all based on I meditating. Therefore, they are confined to the mind. None of them can give any idea of the reality of our soul. But great master says we can find the soul. How do we do it then? Is there a method to do it? No. All methods are designed by the mind. Is there a way to do it? No. The way is a mind mental process. Then how can we do it? He said there is a simple thing going on in our life which makes it happen. And the simple thing is when you want to do something, it makes you put in an effort. Whatever makes you put in an effort is a mental thing. You can't put any effort without your mind saying, I want to put effort in it. If you are doing meditation, you are doing it with your mind's effort. Therefore, it confines itself to the mind. But if something is happening in your life here, where you don't put any effort, then that could give an indication what could work elsewhere also. And one thing that we get without putting any effort is being pulled by love when we fall in love with anybody. No effort. People who have fallen in love know that they were never putting any effort, it just happened. When you are pulled by love, it is not an effort. You follow up on that, you make effort. But the pull of love is without effort. It's a pull, it's not a push. Meditation in all forms is a push. Love is a pull. Big difference. And we all in the physical body experience love. In fact, there is something in us which we can't define very well, which constantly says, I want to love and I want to be loved. Where is that coming from? We are all having it. I want to be loved and I want to love. Well, it's not mind. It's not thought. Even if you don't think, that feeling is still there. If love is the secret of something beyond the mind, then love must be the way to go beyond the mind. So that is why the great master described, nothing can take you above the mind except the pull of love from beyond the mind. But who's pull? Where are you heading for? You're heading for yourself. It has to be your own pull. But not of the mind. Not of the senses. Not of the body. 
then where do you find a pull of your old self pulling you to pull you beyond the mind? That's a very, very interesting subject to see where can we find a pull of our old self pulling us ourselves to a realization beyond the mind. It has to be our own soul, our own thing that makes us immortal living thing. We don't know its nature at all. It cannot be described physically. Love cannot be described physically. Emotions can be described. Physical activities can be described. Sex can be described, but not love. Where do we get the answer? Can we have love of the self pulling us? The answer is very deep. The answer is, if the mind creates all the images, if the mind is really creating through memories or experiences outside, do we have any control over the mind to generate an experience outside in which we can see our own self even outside? That would be a good solution. If we could see our own true self, our own soul outside of ourselves, generated by the experience of the mind, that would be wonderful. Because then we can say our inside is pulling us that we apparently would be seeing outside. And the strange thing is that the soul that wanted to be back in its own state, prearranged before taking a mind, that it be able to generate an experience outside which would be representing the inside of our own self. What kind of experience would be that? That we could see outside something that really is representing our inside. The amazing thing is that thing that went outside is called the appearance of a perfect living master in our life. Very strange to say that we are talking of a human being, another human being, and calling him our own self doesn't make any sense to the mind at all. But will it make sense if we really study this further? Yes, because we find that when such a person, a human being, appears in our life, he appears and something happens to us which happens when we fall in love. Very strange that we are having an experience that we feel there is a pull coming. And we can't explain it. We try to explain it. Oh, he's a good teacher. The mind likes teaching. He's a good teacher. But sometimes we don't agree with the teaching. We still feel the pull. I recall, and I often shared with you, the experience of a professor who came to great master. And master, I've come to tell you that what you are teaching people has no evidence to support it. There is no such kind of true home. There are no inner stages of life. There is a physical life is the only thing. All evidence we have scientifically is this body is born from nowhere, dies and finishes. There is no consciousness being retained after that. Why are you misleading these people? Go with the science that is available today. And great master said, Professor, I appreciate your honest opinion. But your experience is different from mine. My experience has shown me there is something more. Therefore, we can have a disagreement on the experience that we have had. But I appreciate your honesty. The professor went away. Next week he was back. And he said the same thing to the master again. And master said, Professor, sir, I told you last time, our experiences are different. So we are talking of our own experience. We are not experiencing somebody else's experience. Therefore, we can have different ideas on based on our different experiences. But I appreciate that you came again to tell me. Third week, he was again back. And the master said, Professor, you came two times earlier to tell me the same thing. Now you come third time. What's the reason? I don't know, but I'd like to come and see you. <laughs> what is that? The man is disagreeing completely. The mind is completely disagreeing with what he's teaching and is still being pulled. He became one of the finest disciples of great master. And I remember him very well because I used to meet him often. 
family friend. But I am only saying, where does this pole come from? Why should it come from a human being? Why not from a tree? Why not from a bird? Why not from the spirits? Why not from the air? Simple answer is, if it came from any one of these, the mind would beat it down. That's not it. The mind is superior to all of them. Our own mind is superior to all these things. Birds are chirping and we say that the bird is telling me something. Your mind is interpreting what the bird is telling. People tell me, we have ascended master sitting in the Himalayas. They convey messages to us. I tell them, the message are all your own minds. I have seen those ascended masters. They send no messages anywhere. <laughs> Why are we making fool of ourselves? Therefore, all these things that are around us, they cannot tell us anything better than our mind. But love can even defy our mind. And therefore, the truth he said is, if you want real realization of who you are, the answer is experience true love. But I said in the beginning that we want to be pulled by our own self, not by another person. Why should we follow a master then? Another human being. The mind immediately objects to that. You don't have to follow somebody else. We want to go within our, our own self. Master say, go as far as you can. And then we make all the effort, use all our mind and discover the functioning of the mind and discover the mind made up everything, including the master. He was not independently born somewhere. We made it up. Why did we made it up? Because the self wanted that to happen at a certain time of the experience. We have come here in this world, seeing it from that point of view, just to have a different experience. We have come into the causal world of mind to see how mind can generate experiences of everything. A creative power unlimited. It has created millions and trillions of different forms of experiences. They are all experiences generated in time and space. Time and space is generated to put experiences in it and that's what we are experiencing. This knowledge only comes when you see the functioning of the mind as such. But when you cover it up with sense perceptions, it looks like it's all made somewhere else. Because we can't imagine we are making it up. When you cover it second on a physical body, you are completely thrown out from that knowledge. And we say there is a big world here, we are living in time and space which is all real. And we come for a short time to have some good karma, some bad karma. We are all bound by karma. What is karma? Karma is merely a classification of events that happen here. And we say some is good, some is bad. Events are happening here. And we have a good explanation. In India, anything bad happens, it is your bad karma. Finished. No more argument what to do with it. Oh, I won a lottery. Oh, good karma. What a great theory of karma. It explains everything. Whoever invented it, I congratulate that person. It will develop a law of karma. But karma is a very essential thing for the mind to function. When the mind functions in time and space, it generates events and places them on a timeline. Time is created all at once. It doesn't flow. We think time is flowing through us and therefore we are experiencing it. If you go inside in meditation, you discover the reality of time. Time is just created by the mind to put events on. And we move on timeline to experience those events. And we think that the future is unknown. A lot of people can tell what will happen next week. I remember a lady came uh, many years ago. I met her at the spiritual front, this fellowship for some meeting and she had dreams that she could see what will happen next week and she used to record them to see if they really happen and they would really happen. Now when such a thing can be recorded like that, something will happen in the future next week, obviously there is something next week that can be predicted earlier. That means the events that are going to happen 
could they be sitting there somewhere to be experienced earlier and then go there and find they are really happening? That's what she recorded. When she met me on the East Coast, she wanted to come and meet me again and discuss true spirituality, not merely the dream that she was having. And I made an appointment. I had just come to the United States and got a little job. And I had <coughs> working in a small office. And I said, I will meet you in that office, small office, there, there in Oak Brook or somewhere here. And she said, okay, he gave her the time. As it happened, I was working with two partners and we suddenly made a lot of money. And my partners wanted to show off. So they bought a big <laughs> limousine, big car. And they said, we don't meet that lady in this little office. We'll meet her in a hotel, five-star hotel, at Regency. That lady had a dream one week before the meeting that she has come to see me and I have just, and she's waiting in a lobby of a hotel. That's a dream she's having. Lobby of a hotel. And I come and I stretch them as in. And I get out and I say hello to her. And she's surprised. How come that he's in a big car like that and waiting in a hotel? Poor fellow. That's what she thought after the dream. But she recorded it. She says, when I go to him, I'll show him maybe he has some power to alter these dreams of mine. And he made it a big dream. When she came, she got a notice one day earlier, don't meet in the office, meet in Hyatt Regency. She was surprised. She brought a journal with her. When she got down, she said, here's what I wrote last week. Then I see you here. What does it show? That what was to happen a week later, she knew a week earlier, not by any particular meditation, by a dream. But sometimes you can do a meditation. I often told you the story of the Bhatra guy, the turbaned guy, when I had given an interview for the Navy in India, in Lucknow. And he appeared from nowhere. He said, good luck, good luck. And I said, why are you speaking in English? He said, sitting in India. He said, because you have good luck. And then he said, do you have a piece of paper? I said, yes, I had come up with a bag of papers with me. I gave a piece of paper. And he looked at into my eyes and began to write something on it. Then he said, fold this paper, double fold it, hold it in your hand. I said, okay. Then he said, take out another paper, write the name of a flower. I said, I have heard this story many times. We all write rose flower, common flower. I said, I am going to write the name of a flower he may not have heard of. In Punjab, we use it. In, we are in UP, in Uttar Pradesh, he may not have heard of. So I wrote Chameli, C-H-A-M-E-L-I in capitals. He said, write a number between 1 and 10. I said, he's expecting me to write 5. Common children do that trick. So I said, I'm not going to write 5, I'm going to call it bluff off. And wrote 3. He said, write your date of birth. I wrote 1926. That is not your date of birth, that's your year. Write your date. So normally we write the date before the year, but I wrote it after that. He said, the open the page I gave you before you wrote anything. When opened the page, it said Chameli in capital. 3, 1926 and then the date. Exactly like I wrote. Now that surprised me more than ever. Not only it surprised me that he knew an event that was going to happen, but how could he know it when I am determining that event in my head? I am thinking, before I could say anything, he said, shall I tell you more? I said, go ahead, say, I'm already in the shock. He said, when I asked you to write a flower, you said, I am going to call it bluff off. I'll write the name of flower he hasn't heard of. He repeated my thought. When I asked you to write a number and your thought was, I think he will think I will write five and I will write three. He repeated my thoughts, which took place before, took place after he wrote his paper. Not only he knew what will happen, he knew how I will think and do have, have. It was a very big eye opener for me. Because even trying to understand that everything is predetermined, I was misunderstanding completely till that time that what is predetermined are the events of life. 
I did not understand that what is predetermined are not the facts of life, but the thinking about them. That are thoughts which we think are generating a new event are predetermined. That explained so much to me that when we say the future is predetermined, it's not determined merely by the event that will take place. The events follow our thought. Therefore, how we will think and come to conclusions, how we'll make plans, how we'll say this is how it will happen, it's a free will we are using that is pre recorded. It was a shock to me that what we call free will is a pre recorded free will. Is yet it's a free will? We experience it. It's experienced exactly as free will. We can't imagine that if we are thinking about something and deciding something, it's pre recorded somewhere. And when we say somewhere, somewhere where? In our own head, nowhere outside. It's all within our own self. These are amazing experiences. But if you go to the causal plane by meditating within the inner body, you discover the whole setup there. You get a knowledge that you can never find in any books, I can tell you. I haven't seen any books containing that knowledge which you can get merely by entering the causal plane. And yet, that is not the end of the journey. As we find, we generate at that phase with the power of the soul, power of life itself, the power of our own self, true self. The true self's power generates an experience that the memory should be so written that when we are tired of the experience here, a human being appears, which is our own self expressing itself outside. It's only at that point you discover that the man who is pulling you, great master in my case, is my own self being generated as experience outside. Therefore, the pull I felt for him was the pull inside. Any verification? Yes. After the pull outside, I found he was also inside pulling me as the sensory state, astral body. When I went to the caller cell, he was also there pulling me there. I didn't know which, who is he? Is he the physical being? Is he that radiant form inside? Is he the companion who's come to me at the causal plane? Or when his love pulled me and I could forget the mind, become unaware of the mind, I discovered myself that it was he himself and I was the same. At the end you discover that who you thought was an outsider, a perfect living master, was nobody but your own true self. And this experience has been generated as the most beautiful way that when we are tired of the experiences generated by ourselves, which we call our destinies, then we have had enough of it. The soul has predetermined, if we can call it predetermination, because there is no time there. If we can call it, because just for understanding, that if the soul has predetermined, I want to have the experience this far and not more, on the timeline, the mind will generate an experience of meeting a person who will be called perfect living master, a teacher, great eminence, enlightened be, whatever we like to call, is merely a name given to our own true self. Our own true self is pulling through all these experiences we are going through. What a wonderful thing to know and to share. I am sharing something with you. I am sharing an experience of which there is no equal at all. And yet, we are all wanting to know who we are. The method to know who you are is Go within yourself, go within. If you are seeking to go to your true self, I can tell you with certainty a perfect living master will appear in your life. You can't find him. You can't find him because if he is going to be that person who, from where you experience that kind of love, he will be an ordinary person. You cannot love an extraordinary person. I give example, if an extraordinary being came into this hall today and was flying in the sky, that's extraordinary. We can't fly and hear a person flying. What? We all look up. You will forget me and my talk and you look at that guy. Why is he flying up there? And many of you will say, there must be some string, some arrangement he has made. It's just a circus show or something. Some will say, maybe he learned some levitation through some yogic practices. And we could only hop a little bit when we practice. He's, he's master of that. Therefore, he's gone up. And some will admire. Some may even start worshipping that person. 
we can admire, adore, worship, praise, not love. Love will not come. It's too different from us. If he falls down by chance, or he falls down here, we'll all rush to him. First sign of love and compassion will come if he has fallen down. He's like us. Don't forget, love is experienced by a human being, from a human being. The rest is attachment. Attachments can be to the house, to your children, to anything. Attachment is different from love. In love, you forget yourself, the beloved occupies your mind. In attachment, you are more conscious of yourself than of what you are attached to. We call both of them love, but love is not there. Therefore, imagine that when we have that experience of love, it's a way to go back home. Therefore, the mystics, perfect living masters have been saying in history for our benefit that the true spiritual path is one of love and devotion. Meditation is only for the mind. You need meditation to convince your mind to go ahead and do more. You need your meditation, a lot of meditation, to find what is the causal plane where your mind functions. You need meditation to find this world is not the reality, the reality is inside you. You need meditation for all these things. Do more meditation for all this stuff to convince your mind. But once your mind is convinced, enjoy the love that you're experiencing from a perfect living master. That's the beauty of the game. Both, are, both have a place. Sometimes people say, sometimes you say, meditation is only for the mind. Yes, it's only for the mind, but we're living the life of the mind. So we need it. If you were not living the life of the mind, living the life of the soul would be different. Because we live the life of the mind, we have to satisfy the mind, go beyond the mind, and therefore what the mind requires is more effort, more meditation, more struggle. Go through it till you find it's useless to do it because you don't find the soul that way. So therefore, both things have their place. The love that we experience from a perfect living master is a very different love that we've been experiencing from people here. Main difference is that the love of a perfect living master is totally unconditional and non-judgmental. A perfect living master never judges how good or bad we are when he expresses love. He is coming to us, he is coming to love us and to make you experience the real love because you are a marked soul who said my time is right to go back. He knows that the karma, the pattern of karma, pattern of highs and lows, pattern of deeds, good and bad, all part of the package which, is, which attracts you here for lifetime after lifetime. He has come to take you beyond that. To the, to the state of being of your own self where there is no karma at all. Soul has no karma, never had karma, never will. The mind created to have these experiences generates, suffers and, and enjoys the karma it creates. It's all at different level. Perfect living masters come not to make you better people, not to make you enjoy life more, not to make you go to this state or that state, not to take you to astral or causal plane. They come to take you with the power of love beyond the mind to your true home where you belong. When you discover your own truth, you are a soul. You are the life that became the mind, the body and everything. The life made everything active, alive. Then you discover that's your reality. You also discover that's not your full reality. There's one step above that. Even perfect living masters are very few who know that. It's amazing. I call all those masters, perfect living masters, who can take you above the mind. And I say they are super perfect living masters who can tell you that even the individual soul is not your reality. That you have never been separated from totality. That you are participating in totality. When you realize your totality, you are the totality of consciousness, totality of life. And the soul is merely a participant in it, never separated from it. That discovery gives you the final realization who you are. All this possible in a human life, in a human body. And not available in any other form of life. Not even as angels, not even as enlightened people of different levels, only as a human body. What a wonderful thing. I am very happy to come and share these things with you because you are all travelers on the same path. We are all co-travelers. We are all going on the same journey. So 
So I thought it would be useful to have this information about these experiences. I hope that we will be able to practice on these and not use it only for entertainment or only for a very good feeling. Good feeling is not enough. We should practice deep meditation. Go within yourself. Experience the love of a perfect living master if your time has come and you found one or he found you. Practice, practice. Life is short. Human life is short. You can go to any other form of life. Make best use of it. Thank you very much for very patiently listening to my long talk today. But I will see you in about uh, an hour and a half again. There is some snacks. Enjoy them. Enjoy something for the body. And I will see you come back in school.